Hello everyone, I hope you are doing very well. It is now, we're, we are head on into April, and I hope it's quite exciting. So, this past week, you had your assignments about refutation, and, uh, well, you have submitted them by the time you see this, but I, I'll be able to read them and hopefully provide feedback on them uh, uh, as you go along. For the discussion questions about the Don Beveridge short clip, some very interesting ideas, and I'd like to address, there are certainly some uh, consistent themes and answers about that, but first I'd like to review what was said, just so we can you know, remind ourselves so, before we talk about it. Uh, interestingly, let's talk about customer focus. Hey, I want to tell you something. The next guy in your business, the, the next up, or the next customer in that dealership that walks. You go find out if your sales manager is going up to that salesperson and saying, tell me something, that one that just walked out the door? Yeah, what was that customer's basic fundamental overriding need? I'll work you up. But 95 of 100 salespeople in this, in this industry can't tell you. They have no idea in hell what the customer's needs are. But if he says, oh, the needs for a four-door, the, the needs for a red car, Dude, that ain't, I'm not talking about need. The guy came through the door because his kid's leaving for college, and he's looking for a car that she or he can get there safe. Or they came in the car because the neighbor bought a car, and they're looking for a static or an image. We don't know that. All right, so that's the first part of, of the short video, talking about the, the underlying fundamental need of the customer. And he's talking about, you know, cars and you know why people are buying the car or wanting or needing to buy the car and that's very important to understand about why you know people really want something or need something and as salesperson as the provider to understand what those needs are now how that re relates to education is that we need to understand what the student's actual underlying needs are. Now, this is difficult, for, especially for children. We ask a student what they need to learn about, what they want to learn about. Those are different things, especially young children. They're not going to be able to formulate answers about why they need to learn English, math, science, and why they need to learn Korean history, or why they need to learn certain parts of Korean you know, social studies and not others. So, but it is important to know why they, uh, students need to know these things and why they don't learn other things. And it's, so it's important to understand why you are teaching what you're teaching and how you're teaching it. And most of us, most of us had very good grasp and handle on talking about this, identifying the needs of the students and how some are left behind. One of the, I don't want to say the worst pieces of advice, of teaching advice I was ever given, but it's certainly among the most depressing pieces of advice I was given by my uh, Korean co-teachers when I first started was just teach the smart kids. Don't worry about the other, about the stupid ones that's not a nice thing to say, and it's not good. It's not a good way to teach either. But at the time I was teaching middle school in Seoul, and, you know, classes of 33 students, it's kind of hard. It's a cumbersome area. Now, that, that but that was an excellent example of, of what was going wrong in the classroom at, in in Korean schools, you're teaching only for a very small section, the satisfied com customers, so to speak, not teaching for the people who didn't buy in who, you know, the stupid ones, as as described, but they weren't you know, kids aren't stupid. And they just either don't care, they don't have a buy in, they're not interested, or they're prioritizing other parts of their um, efforts. Let's take a look at the second half of the clip. Customer focus in selling says that we identify the customer's needs from the customer's point of view. And it is a sales management responsibility for everyone who walks out that door to say to the salesperson, what was that customer's need? By the way, I even kid General Motors. I've been to every one of the Chevrolet and, and all of those great fantastic uh, uh, systems that you got where you're, you're measuring customer satisfaction. 
are the people who bought the car. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to measure customer satisfaction of the people who didn't buy the car. And there we have it. We have the, uh, the punchline, the kicker from Mr. Beveridge about how we need to identify not just how we're succeeding, but also how we're failing. And that's quite important because then you, you see how you're failing what, and how you're not meeting the needs of those who are not buying your product, who are not buying in. Now, obviously, it's not a direct parallel to education. The kids, the children, the students, you know, they, they can't walk out and go to another you know, school. They can indirectly through their parents, obviously. But you understand the point where they... But they, we do have the buy-in of whether they're engaging with the material, engaging with us as teachers, whether they are studying and are interested, or they're not. And it's part of our job as educators and with the support of administration is that we're able to identify and help all the students as best we can, not just the ones who buy the, our product. So we're not just focusing on the minority. We're f trying to expand that to be a, as large as possible. Of course, he uh, mentions the sales manager. In our context, that would be our vice principal, our head teachers, our principals. Not all of them are great managers. Uh, not all of them are great teachers either, but they should be able to provide assistance and help. Should be able to provide. I have a compliment. Well, I've worked with different managers, and some are great, and some are not as great, but they do exist. Either way, we'll have to learn. You'll have to learn to deal with it uh, one way or the other. But I thought overall the discussions uh, very, very nice, thoughtful, and also very uh, – it's helpful for me to see that you're actually watching the, v the video lectures, not just putting them on mute and letting the videos roll. Last week's was much longer. It was, what, 90 minutes instead of a you know 50 minutes. But – had a lot of great material and a lot of uh, examples of refutations. The assignment there for you, it's not a discussion question, to an assignment, so it's worth more. It's a bit more, was a bit, a bit more involved as well. So I'm very excited to see what you think about that and how your examples, um, your, your analysis of the debates go. This week we're going, we're shifting a little bit talking about interruptions and interruptions are a very interesting part of conversation growing up and for much of my life interrupting was always uh, talked about and seen as a rude thing to do it's impolite but this lecture is going to you know investigate a lot more how invest how interruptions are absolutely essential in conversation in present in presenting as well in in being an active participant of a conversation and being a good listener and so this is quite uh when i first learned this you know years ago it was you know eye opening and how you know interesting it was because i always thought interrupting is bad we should never interrupt unless you know it's an emergency but there are you know actual valid reasons and what we think of an interruption is is one kind of interruption. There's other kinds that are perfectly natural, normal, and expected to do to show that we are listening, that we are being you know, good listeners and participating in the conversation, in, yeah, in, in or engaged in what the speaker is saying. So that's what the main lecture for this week is about. There's also a, an add-on at the end that focuses on what they call tactical empathy or being a very active listener. And I give some examples of that as well. And that's very helpful in getting, keeping other people talking and you know, having them feel good in talking to you, which is very helpful in, in uh, I don't want to say interpersonal relationships. It sounds too sociopathic, but it is helpful in getting people to to keep talking to you, to tell you more things, and to have a to build relationships with people faster, and that's something that can be very very good as a teacher to quickly build interpersonal relationships with students quickly. So it's something to uh, 
um, be aware of and to take advantage of when you can. With that, how about we get into the lecture when we come out of the tunnel? And I think we'll get out of the tunnel sooner rather than later. So we'll see each other on the other side. The main lecture then, talking about interrupting what that means usually we think interrupting as a as a rude thing but uh we'll get into that it's really not it's it's an important part of well of well important part of a natural conversation uh so so far uh with the time delete that last part three two one The most important part or thing to remember about interrupting or having a conversation is that we want to interrupt the person in order to create a connection with the person we're talking to. So we're not interrupting to say what we want to say. We're interrupting to create a communicative connection, a bridge with the other person. So that's why we think that, yeah, it's, inter it's rude to interrupt if we're going to change the topic or disagree with the person before they've completely finished talking, but to interrupt to agree or to encourage them to talk, that is very nice. And it's, a, it's something that people like. So if we interrupt politely and we're creating cre uh, the connection with the other person, we're sharing our own interest and our own idea, our own experiences, and we're actively participating in the conversation. We're, 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 we're feeding, we're giving something for the speaker to work with, to feed off of, to keep going and to, to stay interested in the conversation. So here are some good reasons to interrupt the conversation, to interrupt the person speaking. One, to ask for a clarification or greater detail about something. Two, to say we agree with the person. Three, to show interest or enthusiasm. Also to, uh, to you know, to say like, oh yeah, so you had something similar that you want to talk about later, and more important thing is the most important thing we can say if we decide to interrupt, be sure to we interrupt politely. That's the nice thing. So let's take a look at these different examples. So interrupting to ask for clarification. So if we want the person we're talking to to give a longer explanation or additional detail. It's perfectly okay to interrupt to ask for clarification. This keeps the conversation on topic and it shows that you're listening. Here are some useful phrases. Sorry, but could you go over that again? Or sorry, but would you mind repeating that? Or excuse me for interrupting, but I'm not sure I follow. Could you repeat that? Or yeah. So, sorry for interrupting. I'm not sure what you mean. What was that again? And then uh, also repeating an item from their conversation with a questioning intonation. So if they're talking about having a bad day at work, you say a bad day at work, and they'll go in and talk about their bad day at work, giving more detail, going into longer explanations of what happened. The second case would be interrupting to agree with the other person, especially talk, saying you know, small talk. So small talk, of course, is what we say is light conversations, another phrase. Things like television or books or podcasts or YouTubers and V-Birds and well, you know, what are they called? Uh, what are they Hollow Live, Meverse, all those things kids do these days, what have you. They're, they don't, they're not really important. But you talk... To agree, you would say you agree with a person, and you're like, they're they're talking about their favorite podcast, and then you're like, yeah, you you also listen to that podcast. This encourages them to keep talking. Some examples: I love that book. That last episode of Game of Thrones was so crazy. I think I should change that. I don't think you kids watched Game of Thrones. It's now old hat. I love kayaking in the summer. I also thought his latest book was disappointing. I know. I didn't understand what happened in the last show either. So if 
they're talking about personal experience, their personal emotions or feelings that you've also shared. We can use these expressions. I can totally relate. I've been there. I know exactly how you feel. That's happened to me. I know what you mean. That's so frustrating. I know what you mean. That's so challenging. I know what you mean. That's so nerve wracking. So we're showing that we shared in that experience. Oh, I'll give an example. Uh, when I was younger, you know, you're a young man and you, you, you get you give something to a young woman and when you're a boy and you give something to a girl, a gift, and you're like, oh, now she's going to like me. She's going to talk to me. And they didn't, that, that doesn't work out a lot. And I had a feeling of I've been there. Uh, this was years ago. I was teaching at a middle school in Seoul and Pepero Day happened. And uh, Pepero Day is a very important day for middle schoolers, as you might remember. And uh, this girl gave me a big basket of Pepero. It was amazing. I was like, wow, this is amazing. This is so cool. And the girl was like, yeah, yeah, it's so nice. Uh, you're so kind, John Teacher. La, 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 la. And then, oh. <laughs> uh, I did, about one minute later, I saw this this one boy in class who was angry and crying. But he's trying not to cry. But he had given the girl the big basket of, of Pepero. And then he, she had immediately given the basket to me. Because <laughs> she really didn't like the boy. And uh, I shared in that boy's experience. I could relate to that. And I've been in that same situation. It's very upsetting. <laughs> but, but I got a basket of Pepero, so I was happy. <laughs> I was, I was on the other side of it in that case. So interjecting that we've had similar situations, similar experiences, shows that we have something in common with the other person, and we can talk about it in more detail. And the important thing about uh, this is it creates connection during the conversation. Uh, now, it's okay to disagree with people. It's perfectly fine. It's, it's okay to have different opinions. You know, as long as we're nice about it, as in long, as long as we're polite about things. We, you know, if somebody says, I thought, oh, for example, I, you know, my wife enjoyed the, the, the television show Penthouse and she in, in watched the, definitely the first two seasons. But anyway, she really liked the first season a lot and I, I did not. <laughs> and, but I've learned, I don't, I don't and say that show stupid and you're stupid for watching it no you can't say that you don't say that especially to someone you you have a re relationship with you have to be nice about that you can say it's not your thing or other things but if you're talking about and you're disagreeing with someone about something it's much more polite to wait until they're finished talking before sharing your contrasting opinion something and that's that's advice for life so next interrupting to show interest and enthusiasm and stop honking your horn if you're in a conversation when the other person's mentioning something you're intrigued by interested in, or enthusiastic about you can interject a comment briefly to share your opinion so this shows that you care about what the person's talking about these are showing enthusiasm showing interest as in i've been wanting to see that or i haven't had a chance to read that yet or oh i've been meeting to download that app or I've been wondering how that is, or I've wanted to know how that works, or I'm curious how you handle that, or I'm interested in hearing more. So these brief interruptions help move the conversation forward and encourage the speaker to keep talking. Uh, this is again, I've had experience where I'm talking about something and the other person does not respond, does not show interest. And so I feel like I shouldn't, I should stop talking, which happens. So it, it, these interruptions help encourage a person. So if you're having a good conversation, you'll find that you relate to what the other person has said. If you want to share something similar, it's okay to say that they've sparked something in for you and you'll be, tell them more about it after they finish their anecdote, after they finish the story. So we say, you know, that reminds me. Oh, I wanted to tell you about 
that. Let's come back to that. As you were saying, or that reminds me to tell you about my experience doing. And then they'll finish their story, and then you can tell your story. Now, be sure not to interrupt with a long story of your own, as this can distract a person from their main point, and it's not polite. So, uh, with that, let's take a look at how we can be polite when interrupting, some different words and phrases to help us. And these can also help us uh, to not feel so timid, so shy about encouraging about you know interrupting so interruptions are an important part of active listening and when we're together in person class uh if that happens COVID is is being COVID, so we'll, we'll see but as of right now you know weeks eight nine and ten coming up I, w I want to practice this active listening in person but here are some polite phrases we could use. Sorry, I just wanted to say, see the word sorry or excuse me for interrupting. Can I add something? Can I say something? Can I ask a question? Before you continue, I'd just like to add. Or I'd like to comment on that. I'd like to say something on that. I'd like to add something. I'd like to remind you. These are all nice, polite phrases we can use for interruptions. So all of these phrases show that you respect the other person's ideas and the other person, and you do and you want to make sure it's okay. If you don't want to verbalize your interruption, you can raise one of your fingers or your hand a little bit or lean forward with an enthusiastic smile. That's another possibility. Now, if you're worried about being rude, you can do two things to help minimize the impact of your interruption. Lead your interruption with a question or interactory phrase that shows the listener that you care about what they say. Or apologize for the interruption after you've asked your question. So it's a, what we call, you know, it's kind of a hollow apology, but it, it shows that you're being polite. Remember, if we're interrupting with good intentions, that's good. As in, we're, we're keeping the conversation going, we're engaging people. Tactical empathy, it's another expression. So, here are some methods of interruption that have been proven to be very effective at getting people to keep talking. Uh, Chris Voss, he is a former FBI hostage negotiator, and he he's now a motivational speaker, lecturer guy. But he gives lots of uh, examples of effective listening and active listening and the idea of, it sounds very harsh, tactical empathy. But we'll see, what that means is, when he was working with the FBI, and there's a hostage situation, what he doesn't want to happen is for the hostages, the people being held by, by, the, by the guys with guns, they don't, he doesn't want people to get killed. And if the person is talking to him on the phone, they're not killing people. So keep them talking. And they're also distracted about what the other FBI guys are doing because they have uh, the you know other people are doing other things, trying to sneak in and stuff. So here we have effective pauses. Now, effective pauses. This is something that's a bit how should I say counterintuitive. That the first technique of effective listening of tactical empathy is learning to be quiet and listen so when we're listening to people we have to pause so we ask an open-ended question and then pause and let people answer let them talk so as in, open ended questions are very nice because people will talk about themselves and people usually do like to talk about themselves but a lot of times, we individuals will ask open-ended questions and then keep talking. So if we ask a question, we have to stop talking. This seems very, very obvious, right? It seems very obvious, but 
If you remember from last week, from last class, the video of President uh, Trump and now President Biden, when they were going off on each other, did they give each other? They, they, they didn't let each other answer. They're like, answer the question. Ah, blah, blah, blah. But they kept talking. They kept talking. So there's no, there's no actual chance to actually answer and listen. They weren't listening to each other. They are just barking at each other effectively. So if we're going to, to be an effective listener and have effective interruptions, we need to actually stop talking sometimes. And that happens. Uh, we see that uh, Donald Trump is a, a wonderful example in many, many cases of many things. And that he has a very hard time listening to other people because he likes talking. He likes hearing his own voice. He's, he's well, he is Donald Trump. He, he loves being a superstar. So effective pauses lets the other person talk. And it's something that we have to teach ourselves to if we're trying to get the other person to talk. The next technique is something called minimal encouragers. These are these small sounds, basically, that we say to keep the person talking. They fill in the silence, and they also let the person know that we're still paying attention. So sounds like, mm-hmm, uh-huh, ah, yes, okay. Oh, really? Whoa. These are all small, yeah, the small utterances that help encourage the other person to keep talking. It's important though that we don't overuse it. And um, I can show you an example. Hey Murph. <laughs> hey Ronathan. I heard you're having trouble with your computer. Yeah, thanks for coming down. Okay, so what's uh, what seems to be the problem? Uh, so every time I try to get online, uh -huh. it's asking me for an admin okay. password, sure. but it shouldn't need a password to get onto the internet. Sure. And I should already yeah. have admin privileges on this computer. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Did you get all that? Yeah, yeah, totally. So, you need admin privileges? No, 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 yeah. I already have yeah. admin privileges. Oh, okay. I just Great. need to get on the internet. And okay, it, yeah. I shouldn't need admin privileges. Yeah, for yeah, yeah, I got it. I feel like you're not actually uh -huh, listening uh -huh. to me. Yeah, yeah, sure. Are you yeah, actually okay. not listening to yeah, me? No, or are you saying that you okay, get sure. that it seems yeah, that totally. way? Yeah, totally, yeah, yeah, that's, that makes sense. Okay, you need to stop sure. that. Okay, doing what? You need to stop checking in okay, with me so right. much saying okay. yeah. You need to stop yeah. saying yeah. What do you mean? It seems like you're not listening oh, and that you're it. just focusing got on it. saying yeah, yeah no, and that got makes it sense. and everything. Yeah. Like you took yeah, some okay. kind of active oh, listening oh, sure, class, but yeah. you're not actually totally, paying attention. Totally. Yeah, no, I don't think so. Then why did you disagree mm -hmm. with me a million times mm -hmm. while I said it? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm just showing you that I'm listening to you. So you have a problem with your dog, is what I'm hearing? No, you're it's, clearly yeah. not listening to me. Just shut up. Barrett, shut sure. up. Okay. Shut up. Sure. Shut up. Sure. Shut up. Yeah. Shut up. Okay. Shut up. Okay. Sure. Shut up. Okay. Don't talk. Don't yeah, talk for sure. a second. Sure. Sure. Oh, oh got so you. totally, totally. totally. Okay, okay, if you're actually listening to me, why don't you tell me what I just said? Sure, uh, you said that when you try to get online, it keeps asking you for an admin password, which doesn't make any sense, because you don't need that to get online, and you should be listed as an admin on this computer anyway. You asked if I was listening, I verified that you had admin privileges. Then you spend the next two minutes scrutinizing the way that I listen to you, and my concern for your pets. Then you asked me to recap the conversation, which is where we are right now. So you're gonna fix my computer? Sure, totally. Mirroring is the third example, third technique. Mirroring is just taking the last few words of a person, they said, and repeating it back to them. That's it. That's all it is. This, this we think, this is uh, annoying, but it, if we do it in the flow of conversation, people don't notice. It sounds like we're clarifying things, which is a good interruption. And so... It's uh, it's something here. Uh, if we don't, we we'll, won't notice. So it'll work well. Excuse me, I have to see. This. So imagine you're go you're telling someone that you're gonna about a difficult interaction you had. You have to have at work. You have. They're going to have to tell a subordinate, or a worker, that they're going to have to fire them. Or criticize one of their subordinates. They say to you, "Oh man, I have to have this meeting with Bill, and I have to criticize his work. His work really hasn't been very good." I let a, I have to let him know, and I'm just dreading it. And you mirror this person saying, dreading it, wow. Or, dreading it, wow, that sounds awful. You're just repeating the last couple of words they said, and then you go on the conversation. 
This lets the other person know that you're listening and they'll keep talking. And often if we throw in the rising intonation, then there's a lot of silence today. Goodness gracious. I hope everyone's okay. Uh, if you have a rising intonation, then they are going to interpret that as a question and give more detail because it sounds like you're asking for clarification and they'll provide that clarification. It's a way of verbalizing empathy. Here's an example of mirroring. Hours. Once you go under six, you're like, you're starting to hit like, woo, territory. But <laughs> that's, that's where I'm at currently. <laughs> right at this moment, I'm in the woo territory where <laughs> I'm having this conversation with you, but I want to let you know my periphery is like a little fuzzy and I just really want to go to bed. Your periphery? I'm like, what if I like took a nap? Your periphery? Yeah, like the, the sides of my vision are not focused. I'm, I'm like uh, in that state of awake where it's like, boy... I can function and I can do stuff and I can talk to you, but everything about my eyes is like, what if we closed? What if we just like closed for a little bit? And then, you know, what if we laid down though? That's where I'm at right now. I, I'm fine. I, everything about me is working great, but my eyes are like, hey, what if we just like took a nap? <laughs> So that's my problem. It sounds like you're sleep deprived. I feel sleep deprived. Yes, you're absolutely right. <laughs> what if? But it's it's but it's weird because I'm not like I'm not. I it feels like I'm sleeping too much. Sleeping too much? Yes. I, I maybe it's because my days are now segmented into different portions. <laughs> like I'll go to bed at a normal time and then sleep a little bit during the day, and it could be just because I'm mentally exhausted with staying inside all the time and like constantly wiping down stuff. Here's a great example. If I go to the grocery store, right? And I need to get, I don't know, a carton of milk, right? The other day I went and got my parents milk and ground beef, right? So right. the process is literally like, all right, so I need to go get my gloves and my mask. All right. I'm going to go to the grocery store. I touched a bunch of stuff on the way down to my car. So before I touch my car, I'm going to like sanitize my hands. All right. I got in the car. Now I'm going to put on my mask and my gloves. As I go to the grocery store, get to the grocery store. I go outside, you know, I like open the door. I'm outside. Mm -hmm. I have my gloves on and my mask, go get the groceries and I get back to my car. And then before I open my car, uh, I do a, like the glove maneuver, where you use one glove to get the other glove off, that kind of mm. thing. And then I have a separate bag for those gloves that I then put them into and then, you know, tie it up. And then uh, I take my mask off so I don't touch the mask with my gloves. And then I uh, sanitize my hands. And then I get in the car. And then I drive my ass back home, get out, grab all the groceries, go up to my apartment, re sanitize mess with the groceries then if it's like a plastic thing wipe it down with like a sanitizing wipe and and even the bags itself so now i'm done messing with the bags so then i wash my hands literally all that stuff is so exhausting <laughs> that it's just like i feel Sounds like exhausting. i'm overwhelmed with the nonsense of just the times we live in and it's just exhausting and maybe that's it as well where i'm just like i hate this i hate it I too want to not do this anymore, but I'm going to keep doing it because it's the right thing to do, but it sucks. I don't know if you realize, but my last five responses to you were FBI negotiation responses. I didn't realize that. I was <laughs> I was in my own world. That's the thing is I don't, you could have, you could have gotten thing. me to give That's you a bunch of That's what I realized money. because yesterday I was telling Toaster Woman, I was like, yeah, this FBI negotiation thing, it's cool. It does this thing. And, and she was like, does the thing. And I was like, yeah, like he does it. And I was like, oh my God, she just did it to me. And I didn't even realize it. <laughs> <laughs> like that's how powerful this is. Cause it's literally just, it <laughs> I just wanted to do it and see if you would realize it. And once I realized you didn't realize it, I was like, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, uh, I didn't know you got me. It's also you, you uh, could have got me to give you my credit card number for all I know. <laughs> Your credit card number.
<laughs> yeah, it's uh. <laughs> it's, uh the other thing uh, I learned from it is the tone of your voice. That was another big one because you could be like, "Oh, that's a good question," or like, "That's a good question." Labeling is just naming the people's feelings. So we're we're listening to this person, we're we're, we're listening to their stories of what they're talking about, and we identify what they're feeling. Are they feeling joy, awe, happiness, regret, shame, guilt, fear? So they might correct you because you get it wrong. It doesn't matter. But they identify that you're trying to, to listen. It, but it's important that you, you, know, you, don't, <laughs> you don't get it very wrong. If they're telling you about their grandfather's funeral and intending it and how you know, everyone was crying, you can't go, wow, you must have been very happy. <laughs> that won't, that's very wrong. Don't do that. That will upset the other person. Rightfully so. Um, yeah. Tomorrow is my grandfather's funeral, and so ready for a bunch of sadness there. But he was quite elderly, 101 years old. It's a fine age. Oh, I had a double... Uh, oh, paraphrasing. I think five, rather. Uh, paraphrasing is related to mirroring. It's repeating back what the other person said, but not in their words. So you're not directly saying their own words you're changing it up you're summarizing what they said so if you're using the words they said that's mirroring if you summarize it in your own words that's paraphrasing that's uh, i believe we've used paraphrasing if i ask you to paraphrase a story i'm asking you to tell it in your own words to summarize in your own words not to give a direct quotation and next uh, summarizing, we combine paraphrasing and labeling. And in your own words, you summarize the main point of what the other person's saying, and then you identify how they're feeling. The point is is to let them know that you've been listening, you understand, and you want them to, to see if you, they can say, that's right. As in, they agree with your summarization and identification of what's going on. So that's, that's what we really want them to say, want them to do. Oh. So tactical empathy is a powerful way for you to be an effective listener, to stay connected with your counterpart, with your conversational partner, and build a trusting, intimate relation with them and combine these different reflective listening techniques. We have active listening or reflective listening. They're the, the same thing, but people use different words. People will talk to you and tell you things that you won't believe because they'll keep talking to you and they'll feel like they've been listened and heard. That's very effective to have. That people, f when, if people feel like when they talk to you, that they feel like you've listened so students will appreciate that, co-workers appreciate that, partners will appreciate, everybody appreciates that. And that is a nice thing to be. All right, there we have it. That's the, uh, the, main, the main lecture of that. I want to include a, a brief explanation, uh, you know, paraphrasing of, from that uh, earlier example, the, the, the podcast with the two little cartoon guys. I want to include the setup of that, where the uh, the the lower voice man he explains how he learned about this this method, and then later on, and we heard that or we've heard it already, he attempts to use it on his co-host, and it works successfully. So I want to include that example, that setup as well. And then I've been watching another master class because I got it for David Lynch, but now I'm just watching other master classes. Uh, and there's this really good one with this FBI negotiator, or like a former FBI negotiator, but like okay. he's uh, he pretty much teaches you about how to negotiate and talk and listen to people. And it's actually really interesting. There's a lot of things I would do anyway that I didn't even understand the science behind. Uh, and so he talked about how he like got a girl out of like a terrorist kidnapping in Iraq with Al Qaeda. He talked about. I how thought you were just about the, to be like how he got a girl. Period. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, like All right, other... <laughs> gentlemen, like, let uh... me tell. I was like, Crandor, you did not go to a pickup thing. And he's like, gentlemen, <laughs> let me tell you how to get a girl. Compliment sandwich, which, by the way, is the craziest. 
every time I heard any uh, like business class thing, it was always a compliment sandwich. Was that in this? <laughs> no, it was not. I hate that. I hate it. I hate it where it's like, <laughs> say something nice, then say something mean, then say something nice. Oh, like, yeah. Like, wait, what? I'm I hate that. So, that that's so dumb. messed up. The, uh, the biggest thing, which is actually just part of listening, I learned in psychology, is just mirroring. So, for example, uh, he was giving a thing where he's like, someone had a, a hard day, and they're like, man, I just had a hard day at work. And you're like, you had a hard day at work? And they're like, yeah, you know, I just was at work and uh, someone was yelling at me and, you know, it's just frustrating. And you're like, someone was yelling at you? And they're like, yeah, you know, and it's like, it keeps it going. And it's such a, like, genuine type of reaction because it shows that you're listening, but you uh, they also have to respond with more details. I know that it come, it, it's supposed to be a genuine thing, but because I know what it is, it seems like skeezy. In a way, it is, it's like... It's a sociopath. It could be a sociopathic tendency, but <laughs> it's. Uh, I mean, it's what expert negotiators use. Like this guy used it in the FBI, so I mean, he knows what he's doing. Sure, to manipulate <laughs> idiots with guns. I'm very well aware. Yeah, but it's you know, like he's giving examples. He's like this one guy went to a yoga retreat or some shit, and he's like everybody there loved him, but he didn't. He literally knew nothing about it. They'd be like, "Oh my god, I love this yoga class," and he's like, "You love the yoga class?" We're like, "Yeah, it's great. They had so many things to do, blah blah." blah. And they had food; it was all organic. He's like, "It's all organic." They're like, "Yeah, you know, I'm eating healthier. I'm doing these things." And by the end, he's like, "Everyone's like, wow, I love that guy." And they're like, "Do you know anything about him?" And they're like, "No." <laughs> <laughs> yep. Mm-hmm. So that's just one technique. Like, it's really interesting, just kind of seeing the ways they negotiate and do all these things. And he does examples of it. So he'll do like a mirroring example or he'll do like uh this other thing was like labeling and he gave like these examples of how a certain power, part of the brain like uh, shows activity whenever you label an emotion. So he it's one of those things where they'd be like, oh, you look like or it seems like you're upset and you point it out and they're like, yeah, I'm upset. And they're like, you're upset. And he's like, yeah, the guy's uh, cut me off in traffic. <laughs> it's like, you know, the cycle continues. Right. Uh, or you're the other to, thing is you're like, about to be a triple threat. I'm terrified of you. You're about to be like <laughs> muscular and psychological, and uh, also I don't know. I don't know what the third thing is. A guy who's played a GameCube. That's, that's a triple threat. <laughs> muscular, psychological, GameCube wizard. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. So you play a lot of GameCube games. Yeah, I love GameCube games. <laughs> <laughs> you love GameCube games? Yeah, like Paper Mario's. You love Paper Mario? Yeah, Paper Mario. What have you been doing? You said you're tired. And there we have it. Hopefully, some helpful information. There'll be a discussion question for this week on E-Class. Make sure we'll take care of that as well. This, uh, well, this is fast becoming the middle of April. We're going to have a midterm test on the week of the 26th, so... By my count, that'll be one, two, that'll be in, in, at the time that you are hearing this, that'll be in two weeks future. So as of me right now, that's three weeks. As of you, as of you right now, when you're listening to this, that'll be two weeks. We're not going to have a lecture in that week. It would just be the test. The test will be online. I'll, next week, I'll go over what's going to be on the test so you can prepare and study it will be an open book test by necessity because it will be online and then uh, it'll be very exciting things overall very excited things are progressing very well hopefully you're staying happy and healthy hopefully you're also being able to enjoy the nicer weather because it's uh warming up and things are getting pretty again and the if the air uh, pollution cooperates as well that would be very nice indeed this week we discussed interrupting its purposes how to interrupt and how it can be done in a very polite engaging way and we also discussed and went over tactical empathy and how that's not a nice turn it sounds it sounds very sociopathic too manipulative but that's why some people and i like prefer the term active listening rather than the term tactical empathy, but it is a term nonetheless. And those are all very helpful ways of communicating and listening and participating in conversation and being engaged in conversation. Next week, we're going to keep going 
and we'll also discuss what will be on the midterm test and what format it will take. All right, then. Hopefully things stay sharp and we'll see each other again. Well, we'll see each other through video again next week. All right, everyone. Thank you so much and goodbye.